नमस्ते चैवत जी वेलकम टू अहिंसा कॉन्वर्सेशन प्रश्नी जी थैंक यू सो मच फॉर बीइंग पार्ट ऑफ द सीरीज Thank you for giving me the honor to join honor. the club. The honor is mine. So, what would be your earliest recollection? Uh, maybe even what from childhood. What is either... yours? Uh, sorry. What is yours? Oh wow, that's amazing! Nobody has asked me that. <laughs> you know, I think actually it is not directly of non-violence. but it is related to gandhi my father used to talk about how he was in that crowd that watched gandhi ji's funeral procession go by i see and i see 1948 delhi 48 yes yeah and he would he also used to talk about how he had once cycled to the railway station in lahore at 2 am or 3 am or something because he heard that gandhi ji was on a train that was going to cross the station at that time ah and he and did, said did he finally meet no no he and never he met him finally... but he was able to locate the the bogi and gandhi ji was sleeping with his feet towards the window and hmm. he spoke very reverentially my father would speak with great reverence about the satisfaction that he had seen gandhi's feet Hmm. Mm hmm. Very, very, very touching. I think. Very. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so I guess these are my earliest. Uh, but if you are asking why I am involved in this topic now, that is a response to violence. Actually, it is response to the. You see, my uh, as soon as I came into sort of full adult working life. uh we had many big upheavals first the carnage the killing of six mm. in 1984 mm-hmm. then we had very massive violence uh in many parts of india but particularly bombay in 92 93 of course after of the course. babri masjid this particular series is part of what i hope will be a very long term exploration uh and that's basically you know by about 2015 i got stuck on one question which is what is the story of non violence after gandhi mm so does it have a life after gandhi that i knew that ah. that that that, that non violence is very much around as an idea and as a practice but i didn't know mm. what are the details of the story but does it have a life in india ah, we survey so the world you can ask me that later on when we get to maybe the 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 latter part of the interview, uh, the conversation uh, very good uh, but my my short answer to your question is yes mm if you don't look at it numerically mm okay actually mm-hmm. i suspect that even if we were to if someone were to take the trouble to do that kind of research mm mm-hmm. uh i imagine that even numerically actually non violence may outnumber the advocates of violence wow i think so i tell you why because um you have to scratch below the surface to find that part of the answer mm But In actually, a- it's it's not too far fetched, Narasimha. Your your presupposition is not too far fetched if you consider the condition of the world in general. Yes. And when I teach my students, I always ask them one of the first questions. Uh, actually, this I inherit from from my teacher, Glenn Page. Uh, how many people you know that have killed anyone? That's right. And none raise their hands. That's right. that's right you know so 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 one has to take violence yeah. for what it is and that that's is right. it is an abnormality abnormality not a normal thing yes yes so let's go back to where we were uh, what would be your earliest and it need not be of non violence many speakers have uh, shared an experience of how violence shaped their life yes uh in my case uh also that is the uh, this is the story and 
you see, I, I, I have to go back a little bit in time to, to tell you about my life story. And I hope you do not edit your, your life story out of this conversation. And it's beautiful. Um, uh, you travel the world. And in my case, as, as you know, my father is Indian. My father is here in, in, in Thailand, uh, was here in Thailand. And, and uh, we are Muslim family. So we are Muslim families in a, a, a Buddhist society. And we are Indian Muslim in a Buddhist society. Uh, and then my father made a mistake. He sent me to a Catholic school. OK, so, so I have all my friends who are Chinese in the Catholic school. So I grow up, you know. Uh, praying in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> it's almost like the life of Pi story yeah. that, that you have seen. But, but, uh, but we are actually grounded in, 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 in the belief uh, in God, in, in, in Islam and all that, you know. Uh, and, and then uh, when I got married to my wife, whom I met when we were studying in the States, she's Chinese. Hmm. So it's all very complicated society, uh, family that, that you can see. And, and, uh, and my, my interest, if you will, in nonviolence academically comes after um, the, uh, the tragedy that took place in my university in 1976. When I went to school at Tamasad University, I joined at that time because of the situation in the country. Uh, uh, it was the time of student upheaval against dictatorship. So as everyone else, I was part of the crowd, you know, so I participated uh, in uh, 1973. At that time, I was uh, the second year student uh, in political science. Uh, then I fell in love with, with uh, political philosophy rather than international relations. Uh, and so, you know, it taught me so many things and that's another story. And then um, at the end of my uh, BA study at Tamasat, uh, on October 6, 1976, at that time, I, I have already joined the department as a very, very junior faculty with only a BA, uh, first class honors. They recruited me. Uh, and, and on October 6, 1976, that's where the horror took place at my university where paramilitary force attacked the university. Students were staging a, a, a protest, you know, peacefully. They were inside the university uh, protesting against the return of one of the dictators, military dictators. And they all came, you know, and killed, burned people alive, uh, put them on a tie and burned them, uh, uh, hang them by, uh, by the neck near the tamarind uh, trees in front of the university. Uh, drive a stake to the hearts of, of uh, girl students and all that, slip them and what have you. And all this took place, two points very important. All this took place in the middle of, I would call a holy ground. Holy ground in the sense that it was so close to the temple of the Emerald Buddha. Because of the, the location of Tamasad University, it's in the center of the city. So on one side, you have the temple of the Emerald Buddha, you have the you know, Grand Palace, uh, you have all these things. And, and so every, all this atrocity took place there without shame. And then there's a picture that I show my students uh, all the time that uh, there's a case of a guy uh, hanged by the, by the neck in the, uh, under, under the tamarind tree, uh, a sandal in the mouth, obviously he was already dead, but he was mutilated by someone and 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 what really drove me nuts crazy is because you have then a crowd watching and no one lifted a finger and within the crowds are small children and whatnot and and i was a thomas student at that time but i was not at at, at the point of, of of fighting at the time i i left the university the night uh, of the uh, on the night of the fifth, uh, and the, the uh, atrocity took place on the sixth, and and then and then for all these years, you know, I am in a in in Thailand in Thai society, and Thai society has, a, if you will, a myth 
that goes with it, saying that we are peaceful society. Why? We are a Buddhist society. We are very good to people and whatnot. And my my research, my academic academic area, when it concerns high society, is trying to demythologize that. Given the situation that I have seen, I have a question that why was that possible? What is there in Thai society? So, so I set out to do all this research uh, in terms of violence, uh, trying to say that, trying to trying to find an answer. Mm. But the answer is not that Thai society is worse than you know India, Jamaica, or or, or 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 Peru or elsewhere. It's similar in the sense about its propensity to violence and nonviolence. Uh, but Thai, both, but Thai society uh, has a, um, a peculiar edge. We have a, a very strong capacity to 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 delude ourselves, <laughs> to subject ourselves into a, a perennial delusion that we are peaceful society, and almost you know a lot of people believe it, so to mm -hmm. speak. So my my research is to, in a way, to 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 critique that and to sort of you know take that apart. But what happened was that uh, I was telling you that there were two choices for people my generation. I was in my early 20s then uh, when I finished uh, Tamasat. So I have, we have two choices. One large group of people, a lot of my friends, joined the Communist Party of Thailand to fight against the government in the jungle. Mm -hmm. It's an armed struggle, right? The other group, a uh, smaller one, tried to get out of the country. So I got the scholarship uh, called the East West Center Scholarship. So I went out of the country and uh, uh, with the scholarship, I, I got into the University of Hawaii. It's the center was in Hawaii. Mm. Uh, it's, a, it's a government, it's a US government supported uh, center, uh, bringing in all you know, uh, 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 people from Asia Pacific, Thailand included. And so I, uh, I went there and I, I joined political science department as a graduate student. And I took a course uh, with Glenn Page. Yes. And his course called his course called was called nonviolent political alternatives. Mm -hmm. And he taught me two things very important. One, he taught me that there are alternatives. There are these nonviolent alternatives, even in 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 so uh, dreadful a time a situation and what have you. He taught me that there are always alternatives, and you have to be creative enough to find those alternatives. And secondly, the nonviolence that he taught is not taught as a religious belief. Glenn is a, is a trained political scientist uh, of the you know, 1950s, and he wrote one of the most celebrated work on, on military decision called the Korean decision. And, and what happened was that, um, um, he, he always counted everything he said uh, on science and research and whatnot, you know? So when we said, okay, then this is uh, human nature, he would counter it with all kinds of anthropological research to show that it's not true because there certainly are tribes and people who do not use violence in their life. So if you can only find one tribe, that idea that that is human nature uh, a non -viol uh, uh, violent human, uh, human nature is gone. You only need one tribe to disprove it. So, so but you have plenty, you know, as you know, uh, by the research work of so many people, Les Ponsell and others. And so, and so all these things, I think it suits my temperament on nonviolent political science. So I wrote a dissertation with him, a, a crazy one called nonviolent, the nonviolent prince. Mm -hmm. You know, and 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 uh, you know, it's a it's 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 a rereading of Machiavelli, the Prince, from uh -huh. a nonviolent perspective. So I rewrite the Prince, you know, <laughs> in nonviolence image, if you will. I see, I see, fascinating. But the, the, the yeah, the important thing I wanted to add before you ask the next question is why that is important. Mm -hmm. My idea about that at that time is this simply, Rajni. And that is, I would argue that nonviolent actions has always been in history, the weapons of ordinary people. 
in 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 fighting for justice, in fighting for rights and of whatever you have. In all, in I, I would argue in world history, and you can back it up with with, with uh, research. So when violence happened, it happened because it came from the state side, as I have seen. Yeah. So my problem is that even if you teach them nonviolence, if you prepare the people with the best nonviolent methods, the chance that you will be attacked and killed like it took place in, in at Tamasat in, in 1976 is still enormous. So my problem is how how we can how we can minimize or mitigate this violence uh, effect. So my argument is that then I have to find ways to deal with the state because the state in my view was the perpetrators of violence. And that's why I wrote the nonviolent prince because that's an advice to the prince meaning the state in uh, you know 15, 15 13 when he wrote when Machiavelli wrote it. So in the night in in the late uh, 20th century I I reimagined the state and I was trying to say that okay these are the nonviolent alternatives that you can use not the people that you can use and and because you know uh, I I I I was writing that in in 1980 and and I found that I could not of course top uh, the works like Gene Sharp and others that he has all kinds of of uh, you know uh, uh, compendium of of nonviolent stories and examples and not but not but this no one has done and so I did it Wonderful. so that's that's where it is yeah was it also in Hawaii that you began what I think is a kind of lifelong work of yours which is to look at the issue of Islam, nonviolence, and violence. Did that work also begin in your Hawaii uh, years or did it come later? Very good question. Uh, two, two answers. One is the historical context. And I was in Hawaii in, from 1977 until 1981. Uh, if you remember, uh, the the hostage taking of American embassy in Iran took place in 1979. Correct. So I was in the midst of that. So, so as a result of that, the, the sentiment against Islam, against Muslims, and we were a very tiny minority you know, in Hawaii, you know, and, and so you have all kinds of, of, of pressure, uh, the need to explain, you know, uh, what Islam is, what Islam is not, uh, uh, the violence and all these things, uh, that was there. So, so, and also uh, the other thing was Glenn himself, because uh, uh, at the end of my defense of my dissertation, uh, he asked a question that uh, uh, you are Muslim and, and what are you, what, what is it in you that will make you accept nonviolence? given you know, the tradition of Islam and uh, religion of Islam or the news about Islam or the popular belief about Islam that you have heard and we have been in uh, uh, about like that. So, so uh, because of Glenn's question, uh, when I returned home and I had a chance to start my, my research, uh, the first research I did was on Islam and violence. It's not on nonviolence, Islam and violence. Mm -hmm. And and uh, you are right uh, in one of your writings when you said that and you talk about Gandhi and and the need to begin by looking at violence. Uh, and, you know, for those of you, of those of us who are interested in nonviolence, uh, I, I came along the same route as okay. well. And so I, I look first at uh, at the relationship between Islam and 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 violence. And I did a study of the separatist movement. Mm -hmm. in southern thailand which has already were there so i went down there and and talked to them uh, look at the way in which they uh, study their pamphlets and what have you and 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 try to understand why is it that when you attack for example a bus uh, you separated the muslim from the buddhist you kill all the buddhists you let the muslim go for example and and how 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 Islamic was that, and what are the things in Islam that you use to justify those things? And and so I, there's a need to study it, and and that became the, the first uh, research that was uh, later published by uh, University of South Florida. You can find it online now. 
Right. And if I'm not mistaken, the broad conclusion that I think your the main insight uh, that your research brought out was that there's a difference between uh, religion as a cause for violence and religion being used or manipulated to justify violence. Eh? So could you elaborate on that? Yeah, I was very surprised when I look at the list of questions that you have. Uh, by the way, if we continue with all the list, uh, we will take about three days, I think. <laughs> no, no, yeah, I understand. Now. But 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 uh, one of the things that, that caught me is that you are uh, very much um, on the point. And, and, and you yourself have written about it, uh, about the difference between uh, cause and justifications. And, and that is, uh, in, in my thinking, is very much influenced by Hannah Arendt, like you, uh, that you brought her out. And, 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 and the argument I try to make as well, you know, is along that line, that there's a need to separate uh, religion as cause from religions as justifications. Mm -hmm. Now, if you, if, if you tie that uh, difference between cause and justifications, uh, with, for example, uh, Gautung's notion of peace research, mm -hmm. then he would say that uh, um, the layer of explanation of violence or nonviolent action can be divided into three. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the agency, the one who perpetrate, commit, you know, uh, the act. That's, that's clear. Then the second layer is the structure. Mm -hmm. Kaltung used the term within which, within which the act is committed. Yes, definitely. Within which the, 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 the act was there. And, and the, the structure is the source of the action. Mm. You know? And then uh, the, the, the deepest layer, this is very interesting. The deepest layer is what we call the culture, the cultural layer. And he developed this in 1996. Mm. The structure came in. 1969, so about 30 years apart, you know, that he, he, he came up with this uh, idea of cultural violence, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. but, but I'm not saying, I'm not talking about cultural violence. What I am interested in is that I ask the question, what does culture do to an act or the structure of violence? And my answer is that the culture does what culture did, always does, and that is to justify you know, to tell you what's right and wrong, to tell you what's preferable, what's unpreferable, to tell you that this is clean and dirty and all that. And these are, these are the things that culture does in human society. And so in this, obviously, when you tie this with Hannah Arendt, it works as a justification. Mm. So when people ask me all the time, you know, you look at the case of the Philippines, uh, Southern Thailand, or you know, elsewhere in the world, whether Islam caused violence, I would say no, you know, but Islam is used to justify violence. That's true. Mm -hmm. Islam can be used to justify violence. And then given my experience, uh, I would say that all religions, all. all religions, not only Islam, you know, in Hinduism, obviously, uh, 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 Buddhism, you know, if you look at, at the history of Southeast Asia, what you have there is that you you have uh, you have uh, you know Thailand and Myanmar. We have a history of war uh, for yeah. hundreds of years. Both are Buddhist. No, or within you know, so, the, within Myanmar at the moment. Uh, no the, doubt about it. Uh, what is happening to the Rohingyas? Yes, yes, no doubt about it. And and that's that's between the Buddhist and the Rohingya. Uh, that's right. The, the history of of Siam and and Myanmar was between two Buddhist kingdoms. Oh, I see. And so, and so, and so, you know, uh, uh, in Christianity, of course, you have a history of colonialism and everything you have. And so, and so, uh, all religions can be used to justify violence. Uh, and Islam is no exception in that regard. And so, my my work uh, later on is to to after that piece in in Islam and 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 violence, uh, I wrote. Uh, the one that that um, again at the at the invitation of Glenn, uh, the first uh, meeting in Bali, organized by Glenn Page uh, under the auspices of UN University, 
-hmm. uh, and that came out as a book called Islam and Nonviolence. Okay. And I wrote a piece called The Nonviolent Crescent. Mm -hmm. And Glenn said that, that it, it will be something remarkable and, and bless his soul. Uh, a lot so of people what, read What it. does the nonviolent crescent refer to? Can you describe geographically what that means? I, that is not geographical, Rashni. It, oh, okay. uh, the crescent was used as a symbol. Oh, the crescent uh, as a symbol. Okay. As a symbol. Can you and say more a, about the nonviolent crescent? Yes, uh, the nonviolent crescent is my attempt to uh, delineate uh, Islamic principles in support of nonviolence and against the use of modern violence. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, put it in a nutshell, I was arguing that why Islam may be used to justify violence in the past. But that was possible because of the type of weapons used. The type of weapons used make it possible for uh, warfare or, or struggle or fight to sort of to limit the damage to some extent. Okay, but as uh, human technology progress, what happened is that when you enter the modern era, uh, modern warfare uh, brought with it uh, a new kind of uh, devastating uh, weapons uh, of, of destruction. And, and, and then if you go forward to, to the atomic bombs and now the nuclear bombs, then, then there's no, not difficult, it's not possible to, to separate those who are innocent from those who are not. Yeah. And from, for Islam, because we are a, a religion built on the idea that God is the embodiment of mercy. Mm. And within, within the concept of Rahman, you have also the idea of the innocence. Mm. And that all lives is created because God has a purpose. And all this together. And, and then I, I, I would argue that if you go that route, you will, you will undermine the purpose of creation itself. And therefore, it will be antithetical to Islam, uh, you know, as a, 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 as, as, a, as a belief, as a theological basis and everything. And so, so once I argue that way, then I, I move forward to say that within Islam, there are all kinds of elements uh, in daily life that is conducive to this. For example, um, the idea of Shahada. Mm -hmm. The idea of shahadat is la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. What it is, is a, um, a, a deeply rooted uh, foundation for disobedience. Mm -hmm. Because it begins with a negation. Which is? La, la, la ilaha illallah. There is no God. Meaning there is no other God. Uh -huh. So it begins with a, with a negation. Mm -hmm. But God. So, so if you if you if you uh, if you um, if you analyze the the shahada, which is only two sentences, you have three parts. The first has one word, la. There is no God but God, but God is an affirmation. Mm -hmm. So, so you have a negation, you have an affirmation, and then you have the direction, Muhammad Rasulullah, and Muhammad is the direction. Mm -hmm. So, so I would argue you have the element of disobedience, mm -hmm. which is already within Islam, which is conducive to, of course, you know, uh, nonviolent actions, uh, which we start with that. And, and if you read Teen Sharp, uh, the other way, I would argue that the book itself uh, posed a very important question from a political science point of view, uh, whereas the work of, of, of the American political scientists like Ted Gurr, Ask the question why men rebel. Mm -hmm. Sharp's politics of nonviolent actions ask why men and women obey. Right, right, right. But I wanted to just stay with the question of Islam before we move on to Jean Sharp's work. That how did your framing of the nonviolent crescent address the issue of uh, this obedience to the divine? outside of the circle meaning among what about dealing with those who are 
who don't share uh, the uh, belief that uh, Muhammad is their prophet. In, in other words, with the non-Islamic world, how does this, because historically we know there are many ways in which syncretic cultures have emerged, but how do you see it today in the 21st century? Uh, I have um, I have and I, I felt that uh, when I was taught by Clint, as, as I told you earlier, um, the basis of, of nonviolent action is already scientific. Mm -hmm. You know, scientific, uh, you know, in terms of, of experiment. So mm -hmm. I would come to them with experiment where you have a case of, of how you train uh, cats to live with rats, mm -hmm. you know. And there's a, a, an experiment of cats living with rats. Uh, when you raise the, 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 the cats from three months old, uh, mm -hmm. and also use the cats that are uh, rat killing cat, for example, and you put it in an experimental box and see how, and you can train them. So to finally not only live with the, the rats, but to work together, mm. Rashini, to work yeah. together, yeah. Yeah. to acquire uh, common needs, in their case, food. You follow? So, so I use all of this, uh, all of this thing to 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 render the idea of of nonviolence um, at least um, uh, that can uh, that can garner some kinds of attention from people mm -hmm. who who don't believe. And and you, I am teaching uh, much of the time in Thailand, aside from from elsewhere in the world. But but in Thailand, most of them are Buddhist. Mm. And and so, uh, but they are not uh, traditional in the sense that you know they're 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 Buddhist, uh, but they practically some some of them do not practice so to speak Buddhism. Mm. Mm. Uh, they are Buddhist because their parents are and what have you, and so they don't believe, you know, in in all of these things. So I cannot come to them and say that look, <laughs> uh, 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 the Buddha began with abstain from taking the life of of them. There's some who would would accept that. But mm -hmm. a lot of them don't buy it. But when you come to them with all these uh, scientific studies and, and research and whatnot, they at a point uh, fell at a loss. Mm -hmm. You know, and they have to, I, I, in, in other words, I confronted them with this. Mm -hmm. and, 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 then, and then let them, let them decide. Yeah. yeah. And, then, and then my job was to provide them with then alternatives of yeah. nonviolent actions so, around the world. You're saying this is in the within the Buddhist fold or within the Islamic fold. You're saying uh, all over the world. Um, uh -huh. the, the the Buddhist the Buddhist angle came later. Yeah, yeah. The Buddhist the Buddhist angle came later, and and to be very honest with you, it's it's quite it's not difficult. Yeah. To look at uh, Buddhism both in terms of its teaching and in terms of uh, of of you know the uh, the life history of the buddha yeah. uh, uh, to do that what is in, what is interesting in the case of of buddhists is something else the 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 the, the problem in terms of, of buddhists is that they have to understand that um, like in the case of thai society buddhism can also be used to justify violence yes yes Yes. Yeah. So that, that know, is another. It's, it's a course. different. It's a different ballgame. Of yeah. course, in practice, absolutely. But what I was, uh, I'm keen to know if there is, in the scholarly world, or in the political action world, uh, mobilization within Islamic scholarship or Islamic activism on the issue of nonviolence, because you know it doesn't get reported. Uh, well, it it's uh, it's not quite true that it's not get reported. Uh, I think there are a large group of people uh, using this. For example, in the Palestine, yes. uh, then you have uh, then you have works done by uh, the Nonviolence International uh, uh, people like uh, um, Mubarak Awad uh, yes. started that. I know he's not a Muslim, but his colleagues, a lot of colleagues, are, are there. Yeah. Uh, in Syria, you have the works of people like Jauda Sayyid, uh, who has done works in 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 uh, on Islam and nonviolence. Uh, you have uh, uh, in, in in Indonesia, uh, you have uh, the case of uh, um, 
Abdul Rahman Wahid, uh, who also worked on uh, Islam and nonviolence. He was part of our group when we were in Bali. He later on became the president of the Republic. And so, so you have all kinds of, of stories uh, that come uh, with uh, Muslim and, 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 and nonviolence that, uh, you know, and people now begin to, to record it. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, 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 the work of Mary King, for example, yeah. about the second intifada, uh, mm -hmm. the first intifada, for example, uh, she argues that the first intifada was absolutely a nonviolent action. So yeah. you, have, you have lots of studies uh, around the world, I would argue. Uh, and even in Southern Thailand, uh, yes, there's uh, insurgents and whatnot. But what we do is that when we try to unearth, we try to identify you know, mm -hmm. uh, actions by uh, Muslims to 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 rebalance mm -hmm. uh, the 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 portrait of Islam mm -hmm. uh, in that regard, and there is a need to do just that, and that's why I wrote uh, nonviolence and Islamic imperative. Thank you. Um, so going back to Galtung. Uh, is there anything that you would like to add? Because I know he is one of the influences in your life uh, and he is known as the father of peace studies. But I've always wondered whether uh, peace studies as it has developed in the last 30, 40 years uh, is in any way synonymous with nonviolence or is it not? Because I think there's a lot it's of not. peace. Uh -huh, it's not. So uh, 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 where would you, what do you think is today the dominant trend in the discourse? Because there are two questions actually, separate questions here. One is, uh, what is the nature of peace studies without nonviolence? The other question is that a lot of, in the global discourse, very often pacifism gets confused with nonviolence, uh, which is unfair certainly to the ideals of nonviolence. So can you just give a summary of how, from your perspective, the discourse has shaped over the last, say, quarter century or so? Yeah, if we go back to, to uh, one of the most important uh, research group in peace studies, and that is the International Peace Research Association. I think in the, in the late 70s or early 80s, uh, there was a discussion about forming a commission on nonviolence. And you know, uh, a distinguished uh, peace researcher from, from Europe say that we cannot do that because if we have a nonviolence commission, it will downgrade peace research. Why would it do that? Ah, the, because he thinks that when people talk about nonviolence, uh, they then become religiously oriented and and the uh, and the mission of peace research you have to uh, uh, if i may uh, what johan has done what galtung has done and and many fathers and and mothers of peace research like uh, kenneth bolding and others have done is to to try to to construct a very strong foundation for peace research you know, outside uh, of all knowledge. religions, you mean separating it from all religion and spirituality. Uh, that is to say, to to come up with a scientific foundation of peace research. You know, so if you go now immediately to to the current uh, general peace research, it will be extremely you know very high on uh, Scopus rating and everything all over the world. But the the journal the journal published basically. Uh, very uh, scientific studies using, you know, massive data, uh, uh, you know, a mathematical model and what have you. So they, I think at that point, since that time, uh, peace research tried to, to come to term with its destiny by, by, by bringing forth itself as a scientific endeavor, enterprise, if you will. Okay. And so, and so nonviolence in its uh, younger days, you know, um, in that non is an old thing, you know, but, but it, within the, 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 the area of research, of peace research, uh, it was seen as too much of a preaching thing, too much, too much of a, you know, uh, too much of a religious thing, you yeah. know, you believe in it. 
So is and, there, and, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, please, please go ahead. No, so is this where Gene Shark comes in? Because uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but my impression is that Gene's endeavor also was to, in a sense, either excise or underplay the moral and spiritual dimension uh, of Gandhian nonviolence to make it more pragmatic and more uh, deployable uh, by people who didn't want to engage in any religious or spiritual or even very uh, deeply moral uh, seeking. Am I, am I wrong in this? I want to bring up three points hmm. about Jean and this. Uh, first thing is, <laughs> Uh, he would tell me, you know, that uh, whenever he's invited by uh, people in peace conference or peace studies, he never attends. He declines the invitation to join any peace institute or conference or what have you. Until much later, I, I think I was successful in inviting him to the Spark Masunaka Peace Institute once in uh, 1995 or 1996 when I was teaching in Hawaii. Uh, but anyway, uh, that's the first thing. The second thing is that before he wrote uh, The Politics of Nonviolent Actions, he wrote another book on Gandhi. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, he wrote another book on Gandhi and also another one which came later called Gandhi as a political strategist. Mm -hmm. That came in 1979. Mm -hmm. The, his magnum opus was 1973. So, so, but but it seems like the, the politics of nonviolent action eclipses all of those, all yes. of those uh, contribution uh, on Gandhi uh, that that yeah. Jean had done. Yeah. Uh, and then and then when I say it is complicated, is because uh, I have argued in one of my writings saying that to to differentiate between nonviolence as a pragmatist uh, persuasion and nonviolence as a way of life or principle. I think this is not uh, tenable. Mm. What I, I have argued in, in that piece is that there is a, there's a continuum mm. of this. Okay, there's a continuum of this. And, and, and I have argued using Jean's uh, uh, works also as part of that to argue that this is an illusory division yeah. between nonviolence as a as a principle and nonviolence as a pragmatist because you know if you look at it as a continuum then in the case of gene you know gene was the one who 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 refused to join the army he was the one who who went to jail because of that if you do not stand by the principle why would you do that that thing absolutely you know yeah. And so, yeah. and so, uh, those are the things. But he doesn't play that up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In his yeah. writing, you know, yeah. he play up on the other side because he felt that I and I understand him uh, quite well. I think I think I understand him quite well. I think what he was trying to do is trying he's trying to disengage nonviolence from the grips of of Gandhians. <laughs> Oh, sort of Gand make it Gandhians, more Gandhians to make it more accessible, who, perhaps. Gandhians who preach nonviolence, you know, and not analyze nonviolence for what it is. Yeah. Gandhians who who uh, pontificate on nonviolence and do not allow other people to to develop uh, other things. And and you know, Rashni, I taught a class uh, and I began this class uh, when I returned to Thailand. And my class is called, my course is called Violence and Nonviolence in Politics. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the course that I took with Glenn was called Nonviolent Political Alternatives. Mm -hmm. But the one, the one I taught was Violence and Nonviolence in Politics. So we spent half of our class uh, talking about violence. Yeah. And yeah. the other half talk about the alternative. Yeah. Uh, and and, and the, the interesting thing is that, you know, for a long time, 20 or 30 years, I have never taught Gandhi in that class. And, and that was deliberate. Yes. And, and uh, upon reflection, why did I do that? Uh, I, I changed now, you know, in recent years. Uh, uh, but, but I did that because to me, when people ask, why did you do that? I said that 
because Gandhi is too important. Not because he is not important, but because he's too important. Uh, imagine uh, you, are, you, are, you, are, you enter into a class like that and you have a, a huge tree. You fail to see all the weeds and the small tree. Mm -hmm. they, they fall into the shadows. Yeah, yeah. At, and what you have in today's world are those that needs to be emphasized, needs to be underscored, needs to be brought up to the light. Uh, and you cannot do that if you focus on Gandhi uh, and Gandhi alone. And, 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 and so, you know, uh, you see a lot of other things when you remove Gandhi, uh, what happens is that you have to find other, other alternatives and you find in China, in Poland, in everywhere and on earth, yeah. <laughs> you know, Indeed. including in India, it including is. in India. Right, right, right. Yeah. So uh, sort of to wrap up, I wanted you to elaborate uh, well, actually, no. First, I need you to tell us, can you tell us a little bit about your role as chairperson of the Strategic Nonviolence Commission in Thailand? What does that involve? Ah, that's very important. I have to correct it. Uh, I have resigned from the post about a couple of months ago, okay. uh, and I, I am still a commission, a member of the commission. Uh, okay. What it is, is a, is a, I would say it's a most unique uh, experiment <laughs> use Gandhi's term most unique experiment in the sense that uh, about 25 years ago we began to plant this strategic nonviolence commission in the heart of the security agencies okay so it was a part of the national securities uh, council of thailand mm -hmm. at that time i was its vice president uh -huh. And we have the, the Deputy Secretary General of the National Security Council as, the, as a chairman. And I was the vice chairman of this and, and another guy. And, and what we have done is that our job is to come up with alternative policies, nonviolent policies on security matters. So when, when they come up with the usual things, you know, uh, security oriented, uh, how to use violence and whatnot, we came up with alternatives for the government. So whether they'll accept it or not is another story, but our job is to provide the alternatives. And okay. so uh, Strategic Nonviolent Commission was there for many years and we, we, we were successful in formulating certain uh, policies, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, helping the poor and what have you, uh, uh, um, bringing in uh, people who are the, the protesters uh, for uh, assembly of the poor to sit with the, the commander, the military and all that. We could do all those things in, in, in that to make them understand one another. Uh, until uh, about 10 years ago, the government, one of the prime ministers kicked us, kicked, kicked, kicked us out. Uh, and so uh, I recon. I reconfigured it outside uh, uh, the Security Council, but we still have members uh, of the commission who come from the NSC, uh, you know, to be with us. So it's a unique uh, commission having three parts, uh, uh, people who work in the security agencies, uh, academics like myself and NGOs. Okay. Okay. Yes. Uh, you know, uh, in closing, I want to connect to, uh, issues on which I want to, I'm keen to hear your reflections. One is that you have written about how it is time in the 21st century from us to move away from the Cartesian, uh, I think, therefore I am, to I breathe, therefore I am. Hmm. Uh, because this, uh, it seems very powerful uh, if, if I've understood correctly what you're saying. So one is if you could elaborate what you mean by this and how can it be of help to young people who want to walk the path of nonviolence? Ah, that's uh, two, two different things. <laughs> that's two different things. Um, I don't know, you have two hours for me? <laughs> Go ahead, we have all the time in the world. Yeah, okay, when you say that, you know, and, and you are Indian and I'm part Indian, so, so when you said you have all the time in the world, you know, it can't No, be no, but long. I don't want to impose on you. I don't mean to keep you from <laughs> no, no, away no, no, from no. your work. 
you can uh, you can uh, treat it as two separate questions yes uh, the 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 breathing idea is is this um i was arguing that that what happened to us when we separate ourselves from the other you know and and if you go back to the cartesian model of i think therefore i am and i analyze it in, in more detail in the works uh, what it means is that uh, you have to people always uh, focus on the separation between the mind and body and they formulate cartesian question as a separation between mind and body okay but i would argue that in order to do that the idea of thinking itself that makes you become who you are has to be an isolation act has to be an isolated isolated act and isolating also yes yes it's and isolated is and isolating uh, in the process and you have to isolate from other in order that uh, you can you can think to 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 be who you are and and you know there's a passage from from the work of Descartes to, to show that uh, and and that somehow works not as an empowering people but disempowering and uh, the example i use is that uh, the use of of uh, alcoholic anonymous you, know, you see the 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 use of alcoholic anonymous came after the way that people treat alcoholic in the past as as uh, as a medical problem as as a problem that you have to be cured as a problem that you have to subject that you are wrong you you know all these, these things and and then you have to deal with it um but but then but then uh, the change became when you call into question that idea uh, of 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 separating yourself uh, into into a patient and a doctor, and a, a doctor treated you, and then you know uh, you you, uh, 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 you 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 try to get rid of your problem by medicine, by you know conditioning yourself and what have you. Uh, Alcoholic Anonymous did completely different things. The first thing that they would do uh, in all kinds of AA circle around the world, and that's it. Uh, the the um, what is it? The, a recipe for success of AA around the world as well. They began with saying who you are. I am uh, Shabbat Satanan, uh, you are Rashni Bakshi and all that. And then I am Shabbat Satanan and then I am an al alcoholic. And then I share my story with the others. In other words, you then bridge yourself with the others, not separate yourself from the others. You connect, not disconnect. So your 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 being then is a part of a collective, and then it gives you the strength to fight uh, in, in this process. Yeah, uh, in 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 this process, and then and then finally you become cure. You know, I I discussed this at length. Um, this is a little bit uh, uh, complicated, but but in the end, uh, the argument I try to make is that, and this is possible because if you then move away from the epistemic ground of i think therefore i am which was the epistemic foundation for for science and technology and and human life uh, as such uh, uh, you have to find something else and breathing is is something that you can share with uh, you know all kinds of religious traditions as well you know uh, and with the rest of nature and the rest of nature and the rest of nature and so if you go to the creation story uh both in in, in uh, you know uh, uh, jewish uh, christian islam then you see that uh, god breathed into us and you are connected connected to the others you know in in the in the, in the process and and if you go back to gandhi uh, uh gandhi of course is influenced by several works in the in in his reading one of which is, of course, is Leo Tolstoy. The kingdom of God is within you. How is it possible that the kingdom of God is within you? And, and it's not only the kingdom of God, but God is within you through the breathing. And we are in that sense connected through all of this. So, so 
so so in the in the in in the in the process of being alive in the process of being alive you breathe and when you breathe you breathe in the cosmic dust that is part of you part of me and everyone uh, inside so you are in that sense always connected and it's as you rightly put up uh, uh, point out it's not only human but also other living things as well mm, absolutely you know so if you, if you if you go back to to buddhism that's also the basis of rhythm like hinduism you know breathing anapanasti you yes. know breathe in yeah. breathe out breathe in breathe out and at 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 which point you become part of the whole yeah. you know but the language is different the language of buddhism is the language of detachment yeah. the language of nonviolence is a language of attachment in in the process of how you can then help the world you oh. know grow together you know, uh, move together, uh, uh, fight against injustice together, and things like that. And and so uh, I use that as 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 an example. And I ended the piece with uh, another Indian example that's of Shipko. That's right. That's right. Yes. Yeah. So, what so, was... so that's that. That's the that's the first answer. Uh -huh. uh, the second answer is to you your question about the youth. Yes. And, How can and they you yourself? Be... What would you advise for how they can walk this path with confidence? You see, you yourself have have written, if I if I remember correctly, you said that uh, for them this is doesn't mean anything nonviolence. You know, either it's uh, it's madness or it's uh, of the age or or they don't care, so to speak. For many of them, uh, uh, I think you you wrote that. Uh, uh, your, your, your I may have, but I also often yeah. emphasize how many young people I do meet who want to walk this path. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they yeah. are seeking direction. Yeah, but my 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 thinking about the youth is this: uh, you see, as a teacher uh, uh, working with with young people, uh, at this point in time, I think the age. The generational gap between someone like me and them have become very great. Yeah. Uh, um, and they are very different from me, from you. Uh, uh, what I should say, I, I, I think the generational divide and the generation factor needs to come into play if you want to talk about nonviolence to them how they understand it from their own perspective you know that that's very important we live in a different world and one has to take into consideration that how it's, it's up to us to understand this world and sometimes we cannot lead them they have to lead us yes and they they are creative in their own way and this i learned from from uh, the young people who are now protesting against the the military government each day you know, uh, in the streets of Bengal, they're so smart. They came up with all kinds of things uh, that I would consider nonviolence. And people would come. To me, would you consider that nonviolence? They said, "Well, yes, I haven't thought about it, but but this is very smart the, the way they did it." Sometimes it's a little bit abrasive uh, to the taste of my generation. Uh, sometimes it's rude, you know, uh, in terms of mannerism. But but that's the language of the of the time at this time, and so. So it's us that we have to to learn from them uh, more than than they have to learn from us. So we, we simply, I simply, not be, I simply have to have to find ways to when they ask, I explain what I believe, uh, what is the basis of nonviolent actions, that the way I was trained, and and then you decide whether whether uh, your uh, your method that you are using right now uh, fits uh, this or not. Uh, and the degree to which it will turn into something else, uh, uh, that you have to be responsible for. Because when you think of nonviolence as a weapon, as I do, and it has its sharp edges. And, and, the, the, and we can end here, but I think the most fascinating thing that I did in my work, uh, I am advertising, <laughs> Well, uh, on nonviolence and, and Islamic imperative is is the chapter that I did on on terrorism, and my argument is that uh, 
there is a chance for us to transform terrorists, not because nonviolence and violence and that terror is different, but because they are very much similar. Can you explain that a little bit more? No, I won't. No, I won't. <laughs> but you can buy the book. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> So that's that's the main uh, the main thing that that uh, I wanted to to yeah I I uh, you can look at it and 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 you know and, and see how I explain it. We are uh, between terror and uh, the use of terror and the use of nonviolence. We are sometimes very more similar than we are dissimilar. We are more similar in terms of our our thought process regarding death. We are more similar in terms of our thought process regarding um, um, injustice, because those who use terror also believe that they're fighting injustice. So I never look down on them, okay? And, and then uh, the difference is also uh, very important. The difference, I think that too, one is, is the place of the innocence in conflict. And then the, sec the, the last one is the instrumentality of the action. But this difference can, is, is not insurmountable. You can overcome it. So in that sense, transforming terrorism is possible with nonviolence. Thank you so much. Thank you. That, buy the book. I will, I will. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so okay. much. Thank you. Yeah, Thank we'll you for giving me the opportunity.